Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney from Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you today to our study on the Hebraic roots of Christianity. Now, we need to remember that whenever we're studying the Hebraic roots of Christianity, we must keep everything centered on Yeshua, the Messiah. That's because it's written in Psalm chapter 40, verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. That verse is quoted of Yeshua in Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 7. Then Yeshua himself stated in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Torah of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Yeshua said that the Hebrew scriptures are written of him, that the Torah is written of him. And so in order to fully see Yeshua, you need to see him from Genesis to Revelation. You need to see him in the Torah. So what are a few examples of how we see Yeshua in the Torah that will help us to understand the Bible more fully? Well, we're told in John chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 10, as well as Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Paul explained in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, that it was Yeshua that made covenant with Abraham. And then it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, that Yeshua is our Savior. And then it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, that she, Mary, shall bring forth a son, and you will call his name in Hebrew Yeshua, which means salvation, because he will save his people from their sins. And so we can see that not only did Yeshua create the heavens and the earth, made covenant with Abraham, but he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai when we link the understanding that he's our Savior and he forgives his people and saves his people from their sins by looking at James chapter 4, verse 12, which says, There is one lawgiver who is also able to save. So the one that's able to save, that's Yeshua, he saves his people from their sins, is also the lawgiver. And so we need to see Yeshua in the Torah to see him in his fullness. And so given that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, he also gave instruction to his people to keep the biblical festivals that's found in Leviticus in chapter 23. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, it says, These are the festivals of the Lord, even they are my feasts. You see, Christians commonly think of the biblical festivals as being Jewish feasts but we're told that they are festivals of the Lord. They are His feasts. And so who is the Lord? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, that no one can say that Yeshua is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and he gave instruction to keep the biblical festivals, and they are his festivals, which he commanded his people to keep. And they were instructions that were to be celebrated by both the native-born and also, as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 16, the stranger as well. And the stranger is the non-Jew. So this instruction was given to the house of Jacob, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3. The new covenant, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, was given to the house of Jacob, who individually are the house of Israel, northern kingdom. And the house of Judah, that is the southern kingdom, we're told that Yeshua in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, is going to rule over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So the biblical name of Yeshua the Messiah 
is the house of Jacob, and those who believe on him are a part of the house of Jacob. He gave these instructions to keep the biblical festivals to the house of Jacob. So this, that is how and why a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah should be keeping these biblical festivals because it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, he who says he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself to walk, that means to live our lives as he walked. So did Yeshua keep Passover? Then we should walk as he walked. And so we are looking at the biblical festivals, and this is session number two on looking at the themes of the feast of of trumpets. And so among the themes of the Feast of Trumpets are the following. It is known and it's associated with the season of repentance known as Teshuva. And in the last session, we covered that according to Jewish understanding and given that there is a need to prepare for the arrival of the Feast of Trumpets, that the month preceding the Feast of Trumpets, known as the month of Elul, that that begins a season of self-reflection where we have to examine ourselves and our life and our ways, and we're supposed to repent in those areas where there needs to be repentance, where we've departed from the God of Israel in need improvement in our walk because the Feast of Trumpets and also the next festival, Yom Kippur, are festivals and they are seasons and times of judgment, of divine judgment. And so as judgment is coming, we are commanded to repent and have our lives and our ways in order as we approach that judgment and so we can pass the test. So the Feast of Trumpets is associated with the season of repentance, the season of Teshuvah. And next, it's called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. And the rabbis see that the world was created on the first of Tishrei, taking the word Breshit, the first word of the Bible, which is translated as in the beginning, rearranging the letters, you can have the first of Tishrei. And Tishrei is the Jewish term for the seventh month in the biblical calendar. And so then another theme of the Feast of Trumpets, it's known as Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blast or shout. And it's known as Yom Hadin. And Hadin means the day of judgment. And so we went over in our last program how the Feast of Trumpets is associated and it is linked with being a day of judgment. It's also associated with being a day of remembrance because we're told in Leviticus in chapter 23. And then if we look at verse 24, speaking of the children of Israel saying in the seventh month and the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial. And so the Hebrew word there for memorial is zikaron. And so the Feast of Trumpets is called a day of memorial. It's a day of remembrance. And then it's associated with being a coronation day called Hamelik or the king. This time of year is associated with the days of awe as the days between the Feast of Trumpets in Yom Kippur is referred to and seen as the days of awe or the high holy days. And it is associated with opening up the gates of heaven to receive your prayers and your confession of sin. It's associated with a wedding. It's associated with the last trump or the last shofar. It's a day that's associated with the resurrection of the dead. And it's also referred to as Yom HaKisei 
or it is known as the hidden day. And so we are now going to uh, talk about how the Feast of Trumpets is associated with Hamelic, how it's associated with a coronation day. And so according to Jewish tradition, they say that Adam's first words that he spoke when breath was breathed into him is that Yahweh is king forever and ever. And so um, then this day, the rabbis teach that Adam was created on the first of Tishrei. And so this was the celebration of the birthday of the world, the birthday of man, and the coronation day, or the day that the God of Israel um, was proclaimed and acknowledged by Adam as being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So what's the spiritual application of this teaching or this principle? Well, when Yeshua, the Messiah, returns at his second coming, he will return as Messiah, son of David, or the kingly Messiah. And in returning as the kingly Messiah, he's going to be returning, um, being, and defeating, and judging the nations of the world. And so he's going to be returning with a military conquest. And those who militarily defeat their enemies, they ride a white horse. And so in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and him that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. And then it says in verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And then it says in Revelation 19, verse 16, he has on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so given that a theme of the Feast of Trumpets is the kingship of the God of Israel, this is how the Feast of Trumpets is referred to, especially in Jewish tradition, as being Hamelik, which means the king. When Yeshua returns and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, he will be crowned as king over all the earth. And at this time, Yeshua will be returning at his second coming and fulfilling the role of Messiah ben David, that is the kingly Messiah. Now in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 says, And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. And then it says, I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory in a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." And so once Yeshua sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, it goes on to say in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, And the Lord will be king over all the earth, and that day there will be one Lord and his name one. And so once he returns in military victory and sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to be ruling and reigning over those in the earth during his kingdom. And we're going to see the fulfillment that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow that Yeshua is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. 
as we're told in Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, in ancient Israel, there were four parts to the enthronement ceremony of a biblical king. And they are as follows. Number one, the, the, get, the giving of the decree. Number two, the ceremony of the taking of the throne. Number three, the acclamation. And number four, each of the subjects come to visit the king after he has taken the throne. So step number one is the giving of the decree. We can see this decree in Psalm chapter 2. It says in verses 6 and 7, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. And so the next part of this is that a rod or a scepter is given. In Psalm chapter 45, verse 6, it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a right scepter. So we can see in the book of Hebrews how Yeshua has a scepter of a king. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it begins by saying, God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And now Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now verse 8, But unto the son he said, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so Yeshua is called God, quoting from Psalm 45, verse 6, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he's the king of kings, and he rules and reigns in his kingdom through his rod or his scepter. And that rod or that scepter is a scepter of righteousness. So he administers righteousness in his kingdom. Step number two is the ceremony of the taking of the throne. Kings sit on a throne and are anointed as king. We can see this in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39 and verse 46. In Zadok, the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the shofar, and all the people said, God save King Solomon, verse 46. And also Solomon sits on the throne of the kingdom. And so after Yeshua was resurrected from the dead, he sat down on the throne of the God of Israel being anointed as king as explained in Hebrews in chapter 1. And when he, Yeshua, had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right of the majesty on high. Being made so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You are and you loved righteousness, and you hate iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Step number three is the acclamation. And during the acclamation, all the people shout, long live the king. We can see this in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 31. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord King David live forever. We can see an acclamation of Yeshua as 
he prophetically declared would be the case. They would be calling and crying out for him in his return. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 and verse 39. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, for I say unto you, you shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Step number four, the king's subjects visit him on his throne. During the Messianic era, all nations will be required to go to Jerusalem to worship Yeshua, the king of Israel. We see this in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. And it will come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year by year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feasts of tabernacles. So Yeshua is the king of Israel that's being worshipped during the Messianic era. John chapter 1 verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto Yeshua, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And so Yeshua is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, it says, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Well, that sharp sword is the word of God or the Torah, that with it, the Torah or the word of God, that he should smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So next, there's the clapping of the hands for the king of Israel. When a king of Israel takes the throne, all the people clap their hands. 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 12. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. So Psalm chapter 47 is a coronation psalm. In Psalm 47, verse 1, it says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Verse 2, For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is the great King over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and nations under our feet. God has gone up with a shout, verse 5, the Lord with the sound of a shofar. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. Verse 7. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Verse 8. God reigns over the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. Verse 9, the princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. And so now we are going to continue in looking at the themes of the Feast of Trumpets. And so the next thing we're going to look at is the Feast of Trumpets is called in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 24 it's a day of the blowing of trumpets and so this is in Hebrew Yom Teruah so Teruah can be translated as a shout but actually it's an awakening blast and it's something that's so loud and resonating that it has the ability and the capability to awaken you out of your sleep or out of your slumber. And so given that the Feast of Trumpets is associated with a day of blowing the shofar, we're going to look at the uses of the shofar in the scriptures. And the spiritual meaning for the blowing of the shofar. Number one, the Torah was given to Israel with the sound of a shofar. 
Exodus chapter 19, verse 19. Number two, Israel conquered Jericho with the blast of a shofar. Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. Number three, Israel will be advised of the advent of the Messiah with the sound of the shofar. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 14 and 16. Number four, the shofar will be blown at the time of the ingathering of the exiles of Israel. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. Number five, the shofar was blown to signal the assembly of all the Israelites during war. Judges chapter 3, verse 27. 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. Number six, the watchman who stood upon Jerusalem's walls blew the shofar. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 3 through 6. Number seven, the shofar was blown at the start of the Jubilee year. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 9. Number eight, the shofar is a reminder that the God of Israel is sovereign. Psalm chapter 47, verse 5. Number nine, the ram's horn or the shofar is a reminder of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and the God of Israel's provision of a ram as a substitute. Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. And number 10, the shofar is blown to announce the beginning of festivals and to celebrate the new moon. Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Psalm 81, verses 1 through 3. Number 11, the blowing of the shofar is a signal for the call to repentance. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Number 12, the blowing of the shofar ushers in the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Number 13, the blowing of the shofar is sounded at the resurrection of the dead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Number 14, John was taken up to heaven by the sound of a shofar. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And then number 15, seven shofarim are sounded when the Lord judges the earth during the tribulation. Revelation chapters 8 and 9. Number 16, the shofar is used for the coronation of kings. 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 34 and verse 39. And so there are three basic sounds made with the shofar. These sounds are called tikiai, teruah, and shefarim. And they represent the following. A tiki is a blast. It's a short bass note ending abruptly. Terua, which is known as a trump, is a long resonant blast. And then shefarim are quavers. They're a series of trills. And so on the Feast of Trumpets, it's traditional that when you blow the shofar, you have a tiki Tikiai, Shepharim, Terua, Tikiai. And then this is done three times. And that is done three times in a set of threes. Then you have a Tikiai, Terua, Tikiai, Gedula. And so we are going to continue our study and understanding on the Feast of Trumpets in a moment. We'll be right back. This is Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries. I'd like to remind you that HRN is supported by your love gifts and offerings. And together, you help us make it possible to take Torah and Yeshua to the nations. So thank you for your support and prayers. Shalom. Shalom. I'm Eddie Chamney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you back to our study today on the Hebraic roots of Christianity. We're doing a study series on the biblical festivals, and this is session number two on examining and looking at the themes of the Feast of Trumpets. And we have looked at uh, several things so far in today's teaching, and among them is that the Feast of Trumpets is associated with the Day of Judgment, it's associated with the Day of Remembrance, it's associated with Hamelech, the king, 
It's linked with being a coronation day. And now we're looking at biblically in Leviticus in chapter 23 and verse 24 that the Feast of Trumpets is called the day of the blowing of the shofar. And we have the biblical name from this as Yom Teruah. Yom is day, Teruah means a shout or an awakening blast. And so we've covered in the first part of the teaching the examples of the use of the shofar in scripture. And so it has a variety of uses a variety of applications, and it's going to have a variety of meanings. And while it's a blessing to be able to learn how to blow the shofar and to make the different sounds of the shofar, which at the end of the first part of this session, we shared with you uh, the three basic sounds, and one is a tikiai, and the second is a terua, and the third is a shevarim. And the tikiai is a short bass note ending abruptly. A terua is a long resonant blast, and a shevarim is a series of trills. And so the rabbis teach, nevertheless, that the real blessing is not necessarily to the one who is able to blow the shofar, but the real blessing is to be able to discern and understand and respond to the sound of the shofar in its occasion and in its particular application. And so we have these words, blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your countenance, O Lord, they shall walk. Blessed are they that dwell in your house. They shall be forever praising you, Selah. Blessed are the people to whom these things are so. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And so, Rabbi Sayaji Gaon of the ninth century explained that there are 10 reasons for the blowing of the shofar. And this is outlined and explained in the art scroll, Rosh Hashanah, Ashkenazi, Maksor. This is the prayer book on page 430. And so we are going to look at these various reasons explained in given to us by Rabbi Sayaje Gaon. And the first one is a proclamation that Yahweh is king. The first reason is because the Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, or Rosh Hashanah, marks the beginning of the creation of the world when the Holy One, blessed be He, created the world and reigned over it. In ancient Israel, it was customary at the beginning of the reign of a newly crowned king to sound the shofar to proclaim his ascent as sovereign king over his kingdom. The shofar was also blown to proclaim the anniversary of the beginning of the reign of a king over his kingdom. In like manner, on the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, we proclaim and accept the kingship of our Creator, who is the King of the universe. Therefore, the first reason is to proclaim the sovereignty of the God of Israel and to declare His kingship over the universe. So, the application to this principle is we understand that it's Yeshua who is the King of Israel. He is the King of Kings. He is the one that created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Yeshua, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Paul explains in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, 
that Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. So the creator of the heavens and the earth is the king of kings and is the Lord of lords. It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And we see how Yeshua is the king of kings. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, where it says of Yeshua, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, king of kings and lord of lords. So now the second reason given by Rabbi Seajay Gaon for the blowing of the shofar on the feast of trumpets is it's a warning to repent. Rosh Hashanah is the first of the 10 days of repentance and a shofar is sounded thereon to proclaim and to warn. Whoever wishes to repent, let him repent. If not, let him have remorse later. This is the way of kings. First, they forewarn the people through decrees. Whoever sins has no complaint. Therefore, the second reason is a warning to repent. And so the God of Israel desires that all people would repent and turn to him. Even before Yeshua sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, the world's going to go through a period of time known as the Tribulation, even the Great Tribulation, which is a time of the judgment upon the nations. And this is a time when the nations are given an opportunity before Yeshua sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives to repent of their ways and to repent of their sins. In Joel chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it is written, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe, multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20, it is written, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And so in Zephaniah chapter 2, the God of Israel, he desires and he puts out a call that people would repent before the time of his judgment and his wrath. Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 1, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth before the day passes as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that you will be hid or protected in the day of the Lord's anger. And so then we have in Second Peter in Chapter 3, beginning in verses 8 and 9, also an exhortation to repent before the day of the Lord. 2 Peter 3, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And so now reason number three is to remember to follow the Torah. The third reason for blowing the shofar is a reminder of this truth and to remind us that on the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah, of our obligations to the God of Israel and our obligations to keep and to follow his Torah. And so how do we understand these things? How is the shofar a call to remember us to follow the Torah? Well, Passover is linked to Shavuot through the counting of the Omer during the days between Passover and Shavuot. And so Shavuot, that is the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, is called the Atzeret or the conclusion to the Passover season. 
spiritually, the coming out of Egypt, which is the type of the world and the ways of the world, and the journey to Mount Sinai, where the Torah was given, is related. The God of Israel not only wants his people to leave Egypt, a type of the world, but he wants them to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's Passover. And to know him in a more intimate way by having a greater revelation of him through his Torah or through his word. And so when the people came to Mount Sinai, we have the blowing of the shofar. As we can see in Exodus chapter 19, verses 17 through 19. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the shofar sounded long and waxed louder and louder. So we see how the shofar is associated with the giving of the Torah. And thus it is a reminder then when we hear the shofar that we need to follow the Torah. Reason number four is to hear the word of the prophets. The fourth reason for blowing the shofar is to remind us of the words of the prophets, which are compared to the sounding of the shofar and to take warning of their words. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 7 says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he hears or when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the shofar and warn the people, then whoever hears the sound of the shofar and takes not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the shofar, but didn't take warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and does not blow the shofar, and the people are not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he has taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So, son of man, I've set you a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Reason number five is to pray for the rebuilding of the temple. The fifth reason for blowing the shofar is to remind us of the destruction of the temple and the battle alarms of the enemy. When we hear the shofar sound, we are to pray to the God of Israel for the rebuilding of the temple. As it says in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, Because you have heard, O my soul, the sound of the shofar, we beseech you, O Lord, to rebuild the temple. And so prior to the rebuilding of the second temple, that is the temple that was built with the return of Ezra and Nehemiah, an altar was erected and sacrifices began to be made on Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets prior to the laying of the foundation of the temple. As we can see in Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 and verse 6, as it is written, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in their cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, and Zerubbabel, and his brethren, and they built an altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the Torah of Moses, the man of God. From the first day of the seventh month, that's the Feast of Trumpets, from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord 
was not yet laid. So now we have the sixth reason for the blowing of the shofar, and that is to remember the binding of Isaac. The sixth reason for blowing the shofar is to remind us of the binding of Isaac upon the altar, who offered his life to the God of Israel and the ram who was slaughtered in his place. Likewise, we need to also offer our lives to the God of Israel for the sanctification of his name so that our remembrance may ascend before him for our benefit. The significance of Genesis 22 is the obedience of Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering to the God of Israel upon the altar. The binding of Isaac to the altar is known in Hebrew as the Akedah. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, it is written, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get you into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of the young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram, caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went up and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So when Abraham purposed in his heart to obey the God of Israel and offer Isaac upon the altar, Abraham believed that if Isaac were slain that the God of Israel would raise Isaac from the dead. We can see this in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, as it is written, By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And so Yeshua, in referring to this event, spoke of it in John chapter 8, verse 56, as it is written, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. What was the day that Abraham rejoiced to see? It was the promise of the God of Israel that he would send the Messiah into the world and offer him as a burnt sacrifice upon the altar, a type of being slain on the tree as well. Abraham here in this spiritual picture is a type of God the Father, and Isaac is a type 
of Yeshua, the Messiah. And the event in Genesis 22 is prophetic of the God of Israel offering up his only son, Yeshua, as a burnt offering. In Genesis 22, 7, Isaac asked Abraham, where is the lamb? Abraham replied in Genesis 22, 8, the Lord himself will provide a lamb. Yeshua is the lamb given by the God of Israel to take away the sins of the world. John chapter 1 and verse 29. So we can see that Yeshua is the lamb of the God of Israel in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 and 7. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him that is Yeshua, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And so in Genesis chapter 22, verse 13, we see that the ram that the God of Israel gave to be slaughtered in the place of Isaac was caught in a thicket by the horns. The thicket represents the sins of the world. The ram, that is the lamb of redemption, represents the Messiah who would come as a redeemer and in redeeming his people would be caught in the thicket that is dying for the sins of the people. In John chapter 1 verse 29, it says, the next day John, seeing Yeshua coming unto him, said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, the God of Israel asked Abraham to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. A burnt offering is to be freely and joyfully given without any regret or without any mourning. This is prophetic that the father would offer up Yeshua on the tree, which is symbolic of the wood upon which Abraham offered the burnt offering, and he did it freely and joyfully. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 is written, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that is Yeshua. Just like Isaac submitted himself to Abraham and allowed Abraham to bind him to the altar, Yeshua submitted himself to the will of his father and joyfully allowed himself to be bound to the tree and die for the sins of the world. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it is written, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Just as Abraham offered up Isaac and the father offered Yeshua in like manner, the sixth reason for blowing the shofar is to remind us to offer our lives as a burnt offering to the God of Israel in order to sanctify his name. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This would be understand to be a burnt offering, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. So now the seventh reason for blowing the shofar is to remember to fear the God of Israel. The seventh reason for blowing the shofar is when we hear the sound of the shofar, we are to fear, tremble, and humble ourselves before God, our Creator. For this is the effect of the shofar, which causes shaking and trembling and a deep reverence for the God of Israel. In Amos chapter 3, verse 6, it is written, Shall a shofar be blown in the city, and the people be not afraid? And so the shofar is to remind us to fear the God of Israel, have deep reverence and respect to him. And we do this by loving him and keeping his commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day. What does he require? To fear the Lord your God. And what is having fear or reverence 
for the Lord, it's to keep his commandments. It's to follow his Torah. That's because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. So now the eighth reason for the blowing of the shofar is to remember the day of judgment. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 16. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, will cry there bitterly. That day, the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess. It's a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's a day of the shofar, an alarm against the fenced cities and against high towers. That's pride. And so... The ninth reason for the blowing of the shofar is to remember the ingathering of the exiles. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. And it will come to pass in that day that a great shofar will be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and they will worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. And so then we see that the God of Israel is going to gather the outcasts of his people. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 6 says, The sons of the stranger that joins himself to the Lord, that desires to keep the Sabbath, even him will I bring to my holy mountain. That's Mount Zion. And then it says in Isaiah 56, 8, The Lord will gather the outcasts of Israel, as it says, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. And we see in Jeremiah chapter 50 that the exiles of Israel are gathered when there's the judgment of the nations from Babylon. Now, the tenth reason for blowing the shofar is the faith in the resurrection of the dead. Isaiah chapter 18, verse 3, it says, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifts up an ensign on the nations, or on the mountains, and when he blows the shofar, hear ye. And so we see that the 13th article of Jewish faith is a belief in the resurrection of the dead. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see how Paul associates the resurrection of the dead with the blowing of the shofar. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, in 52, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be saved. And so a common greeting at the Feast of Trumpets is may you be inscribed in the book of life. And so may you be inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. And so... Until next time, Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and it is your love offerings and donations that make this television network possible. And we would encourage you to partner with us in sharing this message of Yeshua and the Torah to the nations. We are growing and in order to continue to grow, we need your support for hiring new staff, for new equipment, and to produce these quality television programs. And so we're calling for a Gideon Army of 300 people to donate $50 a month to help us in this effort. Be a part of Gideon's Army today.